Recording in progress. All right. Hi, everyone. After the lunch break, we would like to welcome back all attendees and participants to the Fourth International Forum on Spice Road 2022. The Fourth International Forum on Spice Road is held as a collaboration between the Negri Rempa Foundation and the Research Center for Society and Culture, National Research and Innovation Agency. The National Spice Community Network or Jaringan Masyarakat Negeri Rempah is a network of community nodes spread across several regions in Indonesia and even abroad, which was initiated by the Negeri Rempah Foundation to bridge the 
enthusiasm of people from various background with a common view to rediscover the wisdom value that make up the archipelago through studies related to spice resources and their use. Sahabat Jagar Budaya Community is part of the large jaringan masyarakat negeri rempah family spread across various regions in Indonesia. And this time, Sahabat Jagar Budaya Palembang is the host of the fourth day of EFSR 2022. Let me introduce myself. I'm Anita from Palembang, Sumatera Selatan, Indonesia. I'm from Jaringan Masyarakat Negeri Rempah, and I represent my community, that is Sahabat Jagar Budaya Palembang. Today is very special day because today is the commemoration of National Maritime Day 2022. So we have special guests, two extraordinary women who will become the keynote speakers. The first is Dr. Amita Satyal from School of Historic Historical Studies, Nalanda University, India. And the second is Professor Dr. Sarah Wat from Dalian Maritime University, Beijing, China. Palembang, South Sumatra is very famous for its poem, which is called Pantun. And I have a Pantun for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I count the number for you. The International Forum for Spice Road is very great. EFSR could gather everyone from about to the world. Instead of setting the time, let's welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Amital Satyal. We're really proud to have you on the stage. Thank you. Thank you All very right. much. Yeah. Before we continue, let me read the curriculum vitae of Dr. Amita Satyal. Dr. Amita Satyal is visiting faculty at Nalanda University and is currently affiliated with the School of Historical Studies. Her PhD was in South Asian history, was completed at the University of California, Berkeley, USA. The main focus of her doctoral work was on the interconnected histories of commemorates spanning the Indian subcontinent and Central Asia up to the 16th century. Lately, Dr. Satyal research interests have shifted toward focus the emergence of ethical consideration in South Asia's early business history. She has more than a decade experience teaching undergraduate and graduate students in history. In the USA, she taught history at Reuters University, Newark, New Jersey, USA, for several years. So we have Dr. Amita Satya with us right now. And please, time is yours, Dr. Amita. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I hope you can all hear me. Properly. Yeah, it's clearly good. Really good. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone present today. It's good morning. morning. Still good morning in India. But uh -huh. um, <laughs> so um, my greetings to everyone. And uh, I would like to begin with thanking the Nigeri Rempa Foundation, who has collaborated with uh, the Research Center for Society and Culture, National Research and Innovation Agency, for their time and effort in bringing this forum together. I appreciate their prompt and very courteous support all along and also record my gratitude for being provided with this opportunity to share my thoughts today. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I would like to uh, share my screen so that I can actually just uh, uh, you can see some slides that I have. So 
So are you able to see the screen? Yeah, it's good. Okay. So um, for the sake of brevity, let me <clears throat> just say that the title of my keynote address, I did give it a title. Uh, it's derived from the aims of the foundation, uh, which I think are very, very uh, important and contextual. So revitalizing the spice roots on three aspects uh, of uh, the spice roots and the reflection that is needed in order to revitalize them. So I have, I'll be highlighting network, narrative, and globalization. Um, so the <clears throat> the structure of my presentation today for the next few minutes would be that I would begin with taking cognizance of uh, some of the aims of the foundation, which I think are, uh, as I said, important. I would then go on to, uh, as you can see, uh, talking about uh, the spice route, which would be the earliest uh, face of globalization. Okay. And finally, and finally, I will conclude by, by uh, offering some new directions along three different lines that I, I already stated on my title, network, narrative, and globalization. So uh, the, the biggest, uh, the earliest offering of, the, of Indonesia and of the Spice Islands to the world, uh, you know, uh, forms the image here. And I think, uh, you know, it kind of just speaks to not just the fact that the Spice Islands and Indonesia, you know, uh, were the, the earliest phase of globalization, um, you know, uh, uh, almost monopolized the spice, uh, spice trade for a very long time, for thousands of years until uh, the 16th century before the Europeans come in. And, but now, I'm looking for uh, um, uh, uh, an entreaty to look into the globalized past and perhaps use uh, the spice route to offer another pathway to, to rethinking globalization uh, networks and narrativities. So let me start. Let me start with a quote by the novelist and social anthropologist Epile Haufa, he's a Fijian uh, novelist. And it speaks to the ethos of, the, of Indonesia, of the Spice Islands, and what the Spice Road represents, largely because it was, the, it was a seaborne trade for the most part. Just as the sea is an open and ever-flowing reality, so should our oceanic identity transcend all forms of insularity to become one that is openly searching, inventive, and welcoming. And I say that uh, because of the unique position that Indonesia, the largest, uh, you know, the archipelago with a lot, around um, 9,000 islands, and the fact that there's, it's, a, it's a huge archipelago, it's all so uh, the fourth populous country in the world, um, and the fact that islands dot the dot Indonesia, uh, for that matter, of, uh, all of South, uh, insular Southeast Asia, um, and for the for mainland Southeast Asia, there's a massive coastline as well of these various countries. Um, I think oceanic identities become very important, um, and oceanic pathways as well. So. Uh, uh, islands become very paradoxical in that sense because islands, uh, by definition, uh, are dependent on the outside world for a lot of their resources, right? So um, it's the strategic, not just the strategic location of uh, the archipelago uh, in, in, and surrounded by massive oceans with the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and then various seas, uh, you know, between those. Eventually, I think uh, it is important to understand that oceanic identities, so uh, and islands particularly, uh, and so in this case, it applies to the archipelago very well. Islands, as I said, depend on the outside world. So they interact because in some senses, there is no choice but to do that. 
um, in that in that sense, the spice route and for all the interactions and the interconnections that it built was partly the result of a very uh, a unique ecosystem that the archipelago has, the numerous islands, the thousands of islands that were interconnected with each other. At the same time, at the same time, islands also, because they are surrounded by water, um, so, the, uh, you know, they're also insular in some ways, as in uh, 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 beyond, so there are community networks, groups, etc., uh, that operate at the level of uh, the island itself. So it's a beautiful mix of interaction and a cultural distinction that islands can maintain, which uh, very few landed societies have been able to do in the past. So I think the, the this discussion and this larger discussion, actually, that the foundation has started on on the spice roots and how uh, you know they can be revisited today be becomes very important uh, and and these thousands of islands that Indonesia that the archipelago comprises and for these very distinguished uh, very distinctive features of islands um, it becomes even more contextual so this is how uh, uh, you know the aerial view of the spice islands. And uh, in some senses, a large part of the discussion today would be, um, you know, how to how would um, uh, the 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 earliest phase, uh, the earliest phase of globalization, was actually in a remote corner of the world with some of the tiniest islands that you can think of. So very tiny, a set of eleven islands. In remote, uh, you know, in the interstice, in the space between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, uh, the Indo-Pacific, and and they become the kernel, the core of uh, the world's first globalized network. Um, that, to my mind, is is a fascinating question to start with, and various historians uh, and other uh, scholars have addressed this question. In um, this map tells us how, um, you know, so you're looking at the Spice Islands here and, uh, you know, particularly, uh, so in, in, in today's uh, provincial uh, distributions, it would be the Maluku and, and uh, the Maluku Islands and North Maluku Islands. So uh, between these islands, uh, what you're looking at is um, the distribution of two most important spices, nutmeg, um, and from nutmeg, you get mace and uh, cloves. So um, although the spice trade in, in the world context is a much larger one, in the archipelago's context, in the Indonesian one, it is uh, really uh, uh, nutmeg and mace and, and cloves. Now, as we all know that uh, there is the ring of uh, fire, the Pacific ring of fire, and these islands were not just remote and tiny, but they were extremely unstable in terms of a terrain. Uh, volcanic eruptions have repeatedly occur. So it's a fascinating story of how uh, uh, these, these unstable terrains, these tiny remote locations, yet that lava, the lava soil that was very amenable for cloves and, and nutmeg, uh, gave to the world uh, one of its most sought after commodities, uh, the spice from uh, Maloko. Now, just a shot of the, uh, the uh, Gonung Bandapi, the fire mountain, um, and, uh, you know, there are coral reefs around these islands. Of course, now with the spice trade uh, practically gone in the way that we are thinking about it today, uh, these are uh, yachting, sea diving destinations and so on. So uh, they are, you know, tourist, uh, a lot of these are tourist uh, destinations now. Um, just to also give you an idea that these largely maritime routes that we call the spice route. Uh, there is another term, but I would prefer not to use the, that. Uh, um, the spice routes have also been called the maritime silk roads. But I think to think of the spice route in terms of the silk road, despite the fact that the was as transcontinental as cosmo, you know, was, was transcontinental, was cosmopolitan and carried many more items than silk, 
Uh, yet uh, the story of the Spice Islands is very different. And I think, um, so I would prefer to use uh, the spice route itself. And as you can see that the, the spice route historically has been a seaborne uh, route. And by the time that the Portuguese arrive uh, in the, you know, you're looking at the 15th, 16th, 17th and the 18th century. So these four centuries are multiple European powers coming to the Spice Islands and a century, and these are centuries of internal conflict, conquest and colonialism to the extent that uh, uh, the spice trade ultimately uh, paradoxically uh, diminishes because um, the, the uh, geographical monopolies that the Spice Islands enjoyed had been broken up by the various powers for their own ends. So um, this is the clove, um, you know, um, and this is nutmeg and mace. So mace is the aerial, the fleshy portion of uh, from nutmeg and so it's really a story of these two spices from these tiny remote locations that, that created the first globalized network in the world. Um, now, just to be on uh, for record, um, you know, at least in recorded history, these spices are not the first known use of spice by humans. The earliest recorded spice used by humans was 7,000 years ago. Uh, and the, the plant called a uh, garlic mustard spice plant has been discovered. Uh, this is the Mesolithic, Neolithic period. Um, so pottery in Northern Europe, Denmark and Germany has yielded uh, the garlic mustard uh, spice plant being used by hunter gatherers at about 7,000 years ago. Um, and what is interesting and striking about this discovery is not just the fact that humans were using seven, these spices 7,000 years ago, but the fact that, um, and this has been a big approach in history writing so far, that uh, spices were really non-essential commodities um, because food was consumed for energy and spices, how much energy would you get from spices? You can't eat loads like you can eat rice and wheat and the other cereals or other food items, right? So uh, uh, there had been a long, uh, long, a long standing approach within history writing that spices were uh, more a uh, luxury, though they were high value, we all know that, but uh, they were not, never, not, uh, never essential items. And yet, uh, we see that humans are not consuming spices for energy, but for taste. So if you were to write the history of food and the history of smells, uh, then your history would begin not, not in the recent past or even 2,000, 3,000 years ago, but as far as 7,000 years back. So this, is, um, this was a University of York uh, archaeology team that, uh, that has uh, discovered these um, deposits in in and the in remains of pottery in northern Europe. Now, the earliest use of nutmeg as a food. So we know that spices also had medicinal uses, right? Um, and some of these spices were also used in incense, particularly around uh, you know two thousand BCE to uh, and and a little little before that and well into uh, the 1700s, it, we had a, your Egyptian expeditions coming and, and uh, there was a huge demand for incense in, in there and then eventually in Rome as well. Um, but the earliest example of the use of nutmeg as a food is within in Indonesia itself at the Banda Islands. So Pule A, forgive me if my pronunciation is not right, um, but the, this was around 3,500 BCE, and these discoveries have been very important because they have pushed back the known use of spice in Asia if within the uh, Indonesian archipelago by at least 2,000 years. So uh, this, uh, and you know, I, I have this piece of information because it is the earliest use of nutmeg in, in the world, and it happens in Banda Islands in, in central Maluku. But the fact that this also kind of tells us a little bit about what I would like to respond later. 
what do what is the earliest phase of globalization so what we see as globalization today uh the worldwide its intense networks and so on clearly these are the times when the foundations of those intensified linkages are being laid down but more than that i want to highlight one very important aspect of these of the spice route and and globalization therefore which is that uh the it was actually the local regional linkages that strengthened the what you call the larger networks called the spice route which is long distance transcontinental and begs the attend uh, you know a scholarly att- focus on how and what roles do localized networks play in in creating the bases for the future intensification of those routes and um this is not just one study there are ample studies that indicate that uh, it's uh, the the what turn into long distance worldwide level kind of exchanges are a series or a group or a cluster of such regional localized networks uh, so you need not just one but several parallel localized networks to develop together in order for uh these linkages to intensify in the way that they turn out to be what we know as the spice route um the earliest record of clove again these are nutmeg mace uh, this is nutmeg and clove that i'm i'm uh talking about not pepper not cinnamon uh because then we would be branching out into different terrains that's not my purpose um this is this was discovered uh in in a in in a house uh during an excavation in syria and this has been dated to 1700 bce as you can see that these are cloves that were burnt uh from you know that the apparently this house was burnt down and you can see the charred remains of these cloves in that house um so the fact that these malocan uh cloves are are found in a in a house of a householder it was not even a palace or uh anything like that but an average householder suggests to us that clearly by by 2000 bce so between 7000 the first spice till into the neolithic uh um, and the bronze age uh you're looking at networks uh fairly regular and and interactive so that uh indonesian spices have found their way into the mediterranean um by this time and close home for some of us uh would be the remains uh excavated remains of spice in in sri lanka 200 bce and these have been discovered from the po- a port called mantai mantai is a northwestern port and again it stresses the point that i was making earlier that there is no way to think about long distance big uh um uh, the the gigantic networks called the spice route without these uh extremely active and dynamic localized exchange systems as well so uh that is the base that is the foundation on which uh a uh, 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 transcontinental um uh, a major route uh like the spice route rests on Uh, this is um afo too it's the oldest clove tree on tanet island in maluku it's at the height of 6000 feet and i found it interesting because this is about 400 years old and uh, apparently it has survived clearly it has uh, the dutch efforts to burn down trees that were not their property so uh, you know it's a it's a very different phase in in the history of spice trade when um, after the british and the dutch enter the arena but as we know that uh, you know the the there were uh, there were uh, uh, limits to how much uh, spice would be exported out of the archipelago so that prices could remain high in europe and and uh, 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 you know the, uh, the portuguese a, couple, a century or two earlier had a very different strategy they would put the nutmeg in lime so that it could not sprout 
basically the idea was that you protect the geographical monop monopoly of the Spice Islands so that a, a, a trade monopoly could be sustained. Uh, and if the British and the J Dutch adopted very different strategies of breaking down that geographical monopoly. And that kind of spelled the uh, end of spice trade as we uh, know it. Now, uh, it, it's just an interesting piece of information that the island of Rhone in, in it's a part of the Banda Islands was exchanged for New York, Manhattan, uh, uh, the British, uh, um, the Dutch, uh, uh, gave away Manhattan to the British in, in exchange for Rhone. But uh, eventually, of course, even the Dutch lost out on, 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 on their, on the pre in the presence uh, within the archipelago, but that there are the separate reasons for that. Um, right now, so coming back to the, um, uh, these are uh, 19th century paintings, uh, uh, well, sketches, from uh, indicating how um, the the uh, uh, nutmeg and cinnamon are now being grown in Sri Lanka as well, so that the British don't have to, uh, so uh, and the Dutch don't have to go into those remote locations and 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 harvest those spices in order for bringing those to Europe. Um, just a, a fort uh, at, uh, this is the, uh, in uh, the Belgic fort, it's a very famous one. And these are a series of fortifications that uh, you see on the coastline. Um, a lot of these would have served as warehouses as well. Um, what you see here is a very interesting uh, sketch again of how, um, you know, and this would be important because sometimes when we think of conquest and colonialism, we think of that a uh, 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 huge gush of force coming in and wiping out everything. It eventually did wipe out a lot of uh, social and pol political and economic relations, but it was gradual, not gradual, not because there was some at the hands of the journalists, rather because even the local societies, the societies they were colonizing were, were you know, taking time, uh, resisting also. And here uh, is an interesting, um, uh, the, this is a warship of the Bandanese and, and uh, you know, they, they are uh, resisting Dutch efforts um, here. In the, in the end, uh, the local population did lose out, but these are interesting testimonies. These are valuable testimonies to the fact that uh, uh, the societies that they were being they were colonizing uh, had uh, you know had an agency, had a voice, and and they did try to shape their own destinies rather than a passive image that uh, we have been trained to uh, believe in. Uh, here is a more recent example of how, uh, you know, the uh, in a Korakura war canoe. So uh, some of those traditions have survived. Um, and these are the Batang uh, Lomang sea nomads houses. And these, uh, the, these are um, actually dispersed almost all over the Spice Islands. And the sea nomads, as you would know, uh, had an had a very important role to play in in the spice trade. So uh, between islands uh, and collecting and transporting the spices was was what the sea nomads did. And their outrigger boats uh, and mind you, the seas around the spice islands are extremely deep. Uh, so you're looking at four to six kilometer deep uh, seas there, and um, so the the dangerous jobs and the more laborious jobs were were done by by sea nomads uh, also. So try to think of a couple of things that I have said so far. One that there are localized regional networks that have got to be strong and dynamic and uh, 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 active in order for uh, in order for leading to what you uh, identify as a transcontinental uh, spice route. So those the importance of localized networks. And second, the importance of the labor, the knowledge, uh, and, and, and the skills of local communities that, that were a part of that entire 
production and exchange system. So very often we speak only in terms of the big merchants, big traders, but there is a long list. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a it's a linkage that we need to understand in order to appreciate that the you know these big routes, these big massive exchange systems have not happened at with the initiative of just a few groups or just a, at certain points of time rather they required sustained initiatives from other groups as well so i will i have now uh, just a few uh, slides in order to sh kind of synthesize what i have said um, but also provide i'm hoping uh, some future directions that the foundation um, and the and the research initiative can take uh, clues from in order to develop initiatives that that can revitalize the spice routes. Yet there are riders attached, and let me talk about those. So there are three possible directions emerging for further reflection, um, given what the uh, the the foundation's goals. Uh, to, to revitalize the spice route, to re-mobilize this route, uh, to reposition Indonesia and Southeast Asia in this larger uh, structure of exchange, and uh, to open uh, a kind of uh, an, a multicultural dialogue. And I think these are extremely valid uh, goals to set, but they're not going to be easy uh, or Rather, if we break down what I'm just pointing out to, then it requires equipping ourselves with more knowledge, certain more information, certain more skills in order to do what you would like, uh, what you would like to accomplish. So I have broken this down into three areas. One, understanding roots and interconnections. And that in, I, I will speak on two aspects of that. Uh, one, the big picture, and second, roots as networks. Second, I talk about not globalization, rather re-globalization. And this shift, this is a paradigm shift. It is not just a play of words. And I will, I will talk about why we no longer need to think about globalization at all, rather think in terms of re-globalization and what might that mean. So please bear with me in just a few minutes, but here I have questioning classical globalization, context, mechanisms, and outcomes, reconstituting the relationship of local and extra locals, and then reviewing the specific requirements of each area. But this will, I have a certain context in which I'm talking about this, so, so in just a few moments. And third, the third initiative that I feel will help with the, the goal that the foundation has set for itself is rewrite history. You know, uh, you, you, we need to provide new narrative spaces for certain themes, certain actors that have not been made a part of history so far or less less of less of a part and second um, also set up interdisciplinary uh, collaborations so let's i want to focus on the nature of the spice route so the big picture looks like from 7000 years ago until the present day what we call the the spice route was in fact several such routes together of various scales, timings, and, and dynamics before the spice route became less active. But by the end of the century, these constituent, uh, 18th century, by these constituent multiple routes were working together. So one, several such routes of varying scales, timings, and dynamics. Second, that these multiple routes had to work together despite their differences in scales, timings, and dynamics. And by working together, I mean becoming interrelated. So the spice route has to be conceptualized as a multi-level, multi-scaler, hierarchically uh, arranged network. And like all networks, it also developed multiple forms. So I encourage those who wish to take this initiative forward 
to understand networks a little bit more so that you know exactly what you are revitalizing and why. Networks, in my understanding, need to be thought of in terms of structures and flows. So structures are elements of a network that are arranged in relation to each other. It's a spatial arrangement. Flows is the movement within that arrangement, right? So all networks and the, the life of a network depends on the structure, the stability of the structure and the, and the frequency of flows. Um, without either of these networks will get tired. So networks also get tired. Um, and what I'm trying to bring us um, towards is to view networks acting as a bridge between social spaces and geographical spaces. So networks have to be thought of that uh, in terms of a bridge building those spaces. So the uh, bridging those spaces. So the spice route is, is not just linking these remote spice islands with the Mediterranean, rather it is connecting, it, it is not just connecting physical spaces, it is also connecting cultures and societies. So very often we think in terms of when we say, when we visualize the spice route, we only think of places over there but the two, social space and geographical space, has to be thought of together. So networks are really relationships. And there are three aspects of networks that, that are definitive. Interdependence, spatiality. Spatiality meaning as, as a net bridging a space. Mobility as a flow, so movement. And interdependence. So these three, and once you, once you know, uh, the foundation builds up on this initiative. I, I, I think it would benefit from uh, a greater understanding or at least taking initiatives that promote these understandings where you where we get a clearer picture of how networks work and, and what they do. Uh, and why should they be revitalized? Now, in regards to my second, my second, uh, Uh, se my second suggestion, when we rewrite history, we are making a discursive revitalization. We are revitalizing the root in a, in, through narratives, through discourse. So it's a discursive revitalization. And I encourage you uh, to think not just in terms of a physical root uh, connecting spaces and cultures, but also in terms of a, a new narrative that you can build. And I have here several or uh, three or four uh, different ways in which you can uh, you know acknowledge labor and uh, knowledge and and I know that we had the uh, we had the professor uh, Adrian Lapian uh, memorial lecture today and no better than professor Lapian to to uh, for a lot of the researchers even in Indonesia and certainly abroad uh, to to carry the, the work that he did forward. I mean, uh, I cannot think of someone who was more interested in maritime history than he was, who talked about uh, uh, local groups and their participation, as well as what are ports and what are shipping lanes and so on. So I think uh, those the histories that, the, that he wrote and his interventions would become a very useful starting point. Um, I also would like uh, to propose that histories can think of spice at the interface of the human and the natural worlds. Um, so you can think of spice root or spice trade as a changing form of human and nature relationship. After all, all the resources that are being traded and profited from are natural. Third, uh, spices become a quote-unquote parable for a planet in crisis. And here I have in mind, particularly the colonial, uh, the colonial period. And finally, spices become a metaphor for globalization. So as I said, if the spice route is the earliest phase of globalization, then can it be the first pathway to re-globalization as well? Um, and let me conclude this part by saying that, uh, you know, in, within Indonesia and certainly everywhere, even at Nalanda, we are doing that. 
uh, can we have more courses? Curricula needs to adjust itself to bringing themes in maritime history, uh, oceanic history, um, and not just history, but also marine ecosystems, uh, archaeologists, scientists, and teachers. And I, you know, I would just like to give an ex the example of a Canadian-based um, teacher uh, project called the Fisheye Project that I have in here. Uh, I have written that down over here. And, you know, you can look at their pages. Uh, they're still searchable on Google. And, uh, you know, you can look at the initiative that they did. And because Indonesia, I, I, you, I would think that there is uh, some research going on in marine archaeology and, and so on. But the more, uh, I think the, the, the great initiative that Fish Eye Projects were trying to do was to um, actually take a, a very high resolution camera deep in, you know, as deep as the, uh, as the, uh, Challenger Deep or the Mariana Trench and so on, and and bring up images of the deep sea for us. So, so the advantage it had was that it opened up schools and uh, learners to what deep seas were about, and we didn't have to do any invasive techniques. This was not like a surgery being performed on the sea where you have all the expenses and all the fantastic, uh, you know, these major... Uh, majorly intrusive um, uh, uh, gadgets and and people. It's just a camera going down and and deep seas uh, reveal themselves to us. So greater appreciation for marine ecosystems, for the vibrancy of marine systems and maritime history would certainly be something to think about. And finally, globalization. Um, I. I would like to highlight only, I have very limited time right now. So just highlight uh, two processes, um, you know, one that we are, we are in a world that is not globalized now or globalization is not something that has occurred now. Rather, it is only visible now. And second, a lot of this is the awareness is generated because of that visibility. So I'm just going to end by saying that this the unglobalized world has never really existed. Um, and therefore, if the spice route was the earliest phase of globalization, then can we, in the wake of all the environmental stresses that globalization has produced, one. Second, the recoiling of the local from the global. A lot of the, the local phase of globalization is an extremely harsh one. So it's given these, we need to rethink connectivities and, and ask ourselves that can there be another way to restore, to, to not restore, to build interconnections, but without the harshness of the classical globalization. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much, Dr. Amita. Oh my God, it's really uh, such a valuable knowledge. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have time for question and answer. However, uh, is it possible for us to send you an email, for example, if we want to uh, discuss something with you? Is it okay, Dr. Namita? Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. So we would like to say really thank you so much for your valuable knowledge. And we have to continue to the next schedule. And the next schedule is the presentation from the panel 6A. The moderator for the panel 6A is Dr. Zamroni Salim from the National Research and Innovation Agency. Pak Zamroni, are you there? Are you ready? Okay, for the panel 6A, there will be... Uh, okay, Pak Zamroni is ready. Yeah, for the panel 6A, there will be... Six or seven presenter, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so seven. Okay. Time is yours, Pak Zamrani. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Miss Anita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is the presentation for final session of Shipping and Trading Routes on the International Forum of Spice Route Conference 2022. And thank you very much for the presentation about. Uh, revitalization of uh, historical site and also networking uh, severings 
in the world uh, from uh, Professor Anita Satyal that uh, having a good presentation and giving a speech of how to revitalize the spice root and also globalization. Professor Anita is from Nalanda University, India. And from the next part, basically, uh, I will invite uh, seven uh, presenters to present about their titles. And the outro papers, the first one is about from the village on the mountain slope to the global trade by Sugun Riando and Putri Novita Taniardi. The second presenter is about uh, trading activities in Kakwas Murung, Central Kalimantan, uh, Borneo uh, by Sunar Ningsri, Hartati, and Basita. And the third one, it's about Kananandukok, a historical tracing of spice trade space in Banten, uh, by Ratu Arun Kamasidwan Kurniawan and Susando Zubi. And the fourth presenter is Abdul Karim, talking about global community feeder base connectivity of Tumini Bay Network and Zulu Zone in the 19th century. And the fifth presenter is about Hafiz Givari Berlianto, Talking about penghubung perdagangan timur dan barat di Nusantara. The sixth presenter is Muhammad Faizur Rahman, Furkan Faiz, and Tori Sutanto. They talking about Sumatra sport cities in world maritime trade according to Arabic literature. And the last one is the last presenter is Fisda Harin Regia, talking about selling between past and present by Kalam as wavering practice of Orang Sukulam. So for the presenters, uh, we will give a 10 minutes each for the presentation. And after, after the overall seven presenters presenting their materials for this conference, then I will invite uh, audience to raise a question. Okay, the first presenter, the first presenter, uh, Sugan Rianto and Putri Novita Taniardi talking about from the village on the mountain slope to global trade. Please, time is yours, 10 minutes. Can we still find the connection? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Today, I would like to present our presentation with title From the Village on the Mountain Slope to Global Trade. Sing Liangan as ancient Mataram village. This paper is written by Skung Lianto and Putri Novia Taniardi from the Center for Prehistoric and History Archaeology. This is the pointers of our presentation. Number one, preliminary. Since the beginning of AD, shipping traffic and contact between the Indonesia archipelago and China, India, and West Asia were driven by the intention to trade. The position and role of the archipelago in commercial shipping traffic didn't stop during this period, but continued and even grew, especially with the presence of kingdoms, including the ancient Mataram in Java from the 8th to 10th centuries AD. One of the areas of the ancient Mataram Kingdom that illustrate this is the location that is now a site, namely Liangan. Number two, foreign traders. The foreign traders or the seafarer or from outside the archipelago visit places in the archipelago where the people are well established organize, have faith, and master various technologies, at least since the beginning of AD. This is in line with 
the hypothetical picture of the process of how traders looking for spaces and adventures, looking for good eventually from a fairly homogeneous organized society that gave birth to Hindu Buddhist kingdoms in Indonesia. One of those kingdoms was and one of those kingdoms was in St. Mataram, 8 to 10 AD. Number three, coastal and hinterland. The Tukmas inscription gives an illustration that the presence of Indian elements has long entered in and is quite well established in the hinterland of central Java. Before that, they had contact with the people on the coast first. In the middle of the 7th century, the waters of the archipelago were already very busy at that time, not only because of the passage of foreign boat, but also the dynamic of the maritime world where the big kingdoms in the archipelago itself and continued, continued to the next phases of history. One of these historical phases was the period of the ancient Mataram kingdom from the 8th to 10th centuries AD. In this phase, the areas under the Mataram administration became an important part, one of which was the Liangan settlement in the hinterland on the slopes of Mount Sindoro, central Java. This is the location of the Liangan site in central Java. The location of the Liangan site is on the slopes of the Mount Sindoro. Number four, Liangan as an ancient Mataram village. The ancient Liangan civilization is chronologically at least in the second to 11th century AD, even before the entry of Indian cultural elements until the heyday of ancient Mataram. The Liangan site is buried by volcanic material from Mount Sindoro. The Liangan site consists of areas related to worship activities, residential activities, and agricultural activities, all of it are integral. The data include structure build and building, feature, and features, artifact, organic data, and ECOVAC. The greatness of the Liangan site related to other archaeological data the, that des describe ancient agricultural activities is the discovery of agricultural land and even data on the water management or irrigation. The water management support agricultural activities. At the Liang site, the findings of Ancient agricultural products are another spectacular piece of data. Some of it can be saved and documented, namely rice, clover fruit, a type corn, and another plant, spices, spice, species that have not been identified. The result of the morpho morphological analysis of the grain found at the Liang site indicated that this type of rice was the third type of tropical japonica. It was explained that the center of the diversity of japonica rices is Indonesia. This is several types of agricultural tools are made of iron and some ceramic items from China. And this pottery jug and bowls were found built up and Kibishan and Gandik. This is the rest of the rolled cloth and the cloth pack along with the strap. And this, the, the, the discovery of rice grain was charred by the heat of the volcanic material of Mount Sindoro. This is the Greek agricultural land with elongated mound shape characteristic. And the duck is about one meter wide and at some point it is cut off by a smaller channel. 
1905 from montane slopes to global trade. The discovery of this rice barn gave him new knowledge about agricultural activities, food availability, and management of agricultural product in the ancient Liangan settlement. Since the ancient Mataram period, rice have been commodities that have become the backbone of the kingdom's economy. The ancient Mataram royal trade system also regulate the level of merchants, which include Apikul, Atwal, Adagang, Abakul, Banyaga Bantal, and Banyaga. It is very possible that apart from rice or green rice, there are other agricultural products or even other commodities, including those distributed through the market hierarchy and level of traders. All of Liang ceramic were dated back to Tang Dynasty from China, 9th century. Based on the market hierarch hierarchical scheme and the level of merchants ranged by the kingdom, it is not surprising that goods from China, which are located across the sea, can arrive at Liangan, which is located, located on the slopes of Mount Sindoro. Various types of clothes in the ancient Liangan settlement shows that clothes was not their item at the time. This, this at the same time also shows the existence of exchange activities. It can be between region with the Mataram Kingdom and can also be between island, even with foreign countries across the ocean through global shipping. Number six, closing. Through the Royal Commerce Scheme, with related to rural organization, market hierarchy, or merchant level, the commodities of Liangan were distributed within the territory of the ancient Mataram Kingdom, between islands, as well as overseas. This hypothetical conclusion certainly opened up many opportunities to explore several things related to the topic of this article. The first is aspect the first is aspect of the ancient Liangan settlement in the face of the, the ancient Mataram Kingdom. Second is about the development of the ancient Liangan civilization before the ancient Mataram Kingdom. And the third is the problem of the role of the Liang settlement as part of ancient Mataram in the case covering political, social, economic aspect, including the trading system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pak uh, Sukang Rianto, for your presentations. We have learned from him about the, how the village of uh, Liangan, as part of the village on the uh, mountain slope, would get uh, ancient trade uh, with other islands in Indonesia as well as the rest of the world. And for the second presenter, we, have, we will learn about how trading activities in Kapas, Burung, Central Kalimantan, can also uh, present a good connection in trade activity in the ancient era. And Ibu Sumaningse or Ibu Hartati and Washita will present this uh, title.
Recording in progress.
Recording in progress. The stall become uh, more massive and almost filled the entire open field. The era has more compound than before with row of nitrate uh, divided each compound. Ho made a fascinating illustration about the port as a bustle place with boats on the shore, stalls, multi-layers building, the high city wall, and people from all over the world doing their trading there. Uh, Microp uh, previous research maintained that Ho illustration was on New Chinatown at the east side of the city. But after doing some comparison, we believe this illustrated is taken at Karangantu Port and uh, the red dot here is the position from where Ho drawing the situation in Karangantu. Sadly, because of the confusion to take the VOC site, all his work fastly ruined. After the attack, with the help of Sultan Haji, VOC can conquer the whole part of Banten, close the port, and move all the trading activity to Batavia. Then they turn Banten into a paper collecting place and must transport it uh, to the Batavia as the main port of VOC in uh, Archipelago. From the map of uh, 1780, we can see how Karangantu no longer full with row of stall, but only a few for the daily needs trader. And uh, after 1808, when the Andals burned the palace down and people left the city, the port became more uh, fishery for the local fishermen. Eruption of Krakatoa followed by tsunami swept away the port until nothing left, and the sedimentation uh, changed the coastal line. Karangantu no longer at the shore, but a few hundred meters inland. Several years ahead, another market and storage uh, building for storage of coffee and sugar. This facilitation and the market is to support the plantation need at Lebak and Rangkas Bitung. And here in my last slide, my last slide, I want to show you the maps for a comparison on the transformation of Karangantu, from the position as the center of paper trading space to the point of the decline. As a trading port, Karangantu holds a long history which is very important and closely related with the history of the Sultanate of Banten. We think it's interesting to keep the history alive and preserve the place along with the conservation of Old Banten City. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Arum. And next, we move to the Pa Abdul Karim uh, talking about global commodity feeder bales, connectivity of the Tomini Bay network and the Sulu zone in the 19th century. Please, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Abdul Karim. I'm from Research Center for Society and Culture, National Research and Innovation <coughs> Agency. I will present my article that the title is Global Community Feeder Bay, Connectivity of the Tomini Bay Network and the Sulu Zone in the 9th Century. The Gulf roles in shipping trade network is often forgotten. The bay can be important area in the community and in community distribution. Tomini Bay is the one of large bay in Indonesia. This area specific studies are also very lacking, especially historical ones. Tomini Bay, in some records, did not have significant role in the formation of Nusantara Space Road. However, if the Gulf is explored further, a narrative will be formed that connect the bay with the archipelago shipping and trade network, and even globally. The commodity in Tomini Bay are mostly marine and land product. The product are turtle shells and the, and the sea cucumbers, or we, we know the uh, teripang. Land, land production are rotan, resin, coconut, rice, and the one important is uh, gold. The availability of commodity makes this bay visited by many inter international trader or global trader. So the article will examine the role of Tomini Bay in the Nusantara uh, Nusantara shipping network and how does Tomini Bay has a rule of Nusantara Spice Network. So we can see the the Tomini Bay connect the net the global network. Firstly, we can see the Tomini Bay network. In the maps, we can see the Celebes Island. That uh, this is a, a network. The red lines is a network from. Uh, Tomili Island. Uh, see the activity for the voyage and in ninth century. <clears throat> the Tomini Bay has a character. The character is a uh, network is close seafaring network. In the contrast, is a uh, different with a uh, high sea snake or Voyagers can sail all around a year to distribute commodity and any time in the Tomini Bay then they are distributed to other network so and uh, the, the main commodity uh, in Tumi Bay is a uh, teripang or sea cucumbers and tartar, tartar seals, salt, rice, and gold. This commodity is available and the trade of uh, Gorontalo port and the one of traders from globally traders is a uh, chinese they are both the the all commodity 
and bring the commodity uh, to the China. Next, Tomini Bay is connect the Nusantara Maritime Network. Uh, as you know, is a spice spice network. So we can see from the maps. I can see the from the maps and the black and the black line and the red line and, and then uh, uh, yellow line. This bay, Tomini Bay, supplies trading commodity from the central port, is uh, namely Gorontalo, and to commodity bring Goron, from Gorontalo to Manado, and then from Manado to the the the, the Nusantara uh, network and global network. There are many traders from the, from regional traders uh, the one is mandares bugines and makasares the three tribes is uh, a very important traders in nusantara because they are connect connect uh, port by port for 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 trade and distribute commodity and and also the culture people have authority that is uh, mandarese authority in tomini boat yeah as well as in uh, the bugis and makassar but the distribution of power is mostly in the hands of Mandarese. Uh, the bay is also regularly visit the pirates. But but Mandarese manage to drive them away because they disrupt the trading network system by piracy again and then uh, mandarese against the 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 the, the, the piracy the piracy is still uh, the, the the community from traders next the there is a, a geographical position and wealth of community in Tomini Bay. This uh, 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 make connect to the global network. Why? Because the we can see the maps, the the community from Teluk Tomini uh, distribute distributes for uh, to the Manado and then. Sulawesi Sea and then Sulu Sea, Philippines, South China Sea, and then uh, the last is uh, uh, Teluk Tonkin. Oh, sorry, uh, the Bay of Tonkin. In in its uh, condition, Tomini Bay, Tomini Bay, as a feeder feeder point, feeder points uh, uh, is a. Uh, uh, that where the place uh, uh, produce the produce the, the, the community and then uh, sea cucumbers is a um, most popular commodity and uh, the Chinese are very very uh, interesting and very very uh, favorite commodity in Teluk Tomini The Sulu zone, the Sulu zone, is a, a connect between Tomini Bay and Tonkin Bay. So the uh, ports in Tomini Bay, namely Parigi Motong and Gorontalo, uh, that is that status is feeder point. 
and then collection center as uh, Manado and the enter port is a uh, Tongking Bay as a central port and three three character of uh, three character of bay, uh, port connects by Sulu Sea and it is a very important a very important very important in the in the in the in the, in the, in the global network in Asia so so we can uh, discuss about the the article and uh, in the decision in the discussion session and and terima kasih Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Pak Abdul Karim. A nice presentation. And before we continue for the next presenter, uh, you can enjoy your coffee or tea. Okay. And also please present uh, your question uh, and type it on the question and answer on the chatting room. Okay. Next presenter is Hafid Gifari. Berlianto talking about the, the trade connector between West and East of Nusantara and specifically uh, talking about development
Recording in progress. International trade, especially on the northern coast of Java at the time, with the main product, which is the spice product itself, such as nutmegs and clove, cloves, also influenced the rise of a new social class in the social hierarchy of the Japanese people at the time, the merchant class. These merchants were known to be wealthy and also have a strong political and social influence in the places where they live, especially in the politic and Financial reports. So people who give credits, especially to those merchants, to the sellers, to the brokers, etc., shipbuilders, because especially as we know that the international trade that was running at the time was being done mostly by ships that traveled by sea. And that means that these entry reports usually have a naval facility, a docking facility for ships to be built, to be repaired, to be resupplied, and many more occupation and jobs that are available in these entry ports. Last but lastly, that we cannot ignore is that it's the conclusion of my mind, of my main research, the conclusion of the topic that I put in my paper is that there are three key aspects. The first one is that the entry ports in the northern coast of Java develop as trading centers in the northern in the in the spice trade in the Nusantara archipelago between the 11th and the 16th centuries. So this means that the coastal cities in northern Java at the time were some of the main trading centers for the spice trade itself. So, especially for the spice that came from the Moluca, Molucas Aya Interbank. The rapid development of these entreports as the second main point in the conclusion of my presentation today is that these, the rise of these entreports was supported by the Kingdom of Java, especially the Hindu and Buddhist kingdoms such as Kadiri and then Majapahit that facilitated and protected the trade activities within their territories because the rulers also knew the advantages and benefits if they supported international trade, especially spice trade running through their controlled cities. On the northern coast of the, of the island of Java. And lastly, the development of the international spice trade also affected in these trading centers, especially where also these developments also attributed to the, so the rapidly increasing social changes and the life of the people at the entry ports, such as with the spread of Islam into where most people in these cities were the first to embrace them, followed them by the people of the Japanese hinterland. And then also with the rise of these cities as one, with, with the rise of these cities, uh, the local population also saw a large rise in the merchant class, as this merchant class become the new middle class in the social hierarchy of these entry ports at the time. That is all of my presentation for today. I'm sorry if there are any mistakes. Uh, that's all for me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hamid. Nice presentation. Talking about the development of Northern Java ports uh, before colonial era. And we still have to uh, papers. The next presenter is uh, Muhammad Faizur Rahman, talking about the Sumatra sport cities in what my time did according to Arabic literature in 9th to 15th century. Time is yours, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It leads to connecting with all of you. The first one, I would like to introduce our team. My name is Mohan Fezur Rahman, 
and my friends Tadi Nuar Jastanto and Furkan Muhammad Faiz uh, We are from the, Isu, the, the Sultan Institute which is the Independent Research and Historical Conservation Institution based on Solo City, Central Java, Indonesia In this moment, I would like to present our study or our paper entitled Sumatra Sport Cities in World Maritime Trade according to Arabic literature in until 15th century. The study aims to explain the connectivity of seafaring and maritime trade which established in the early Sumatra, which is island has a strategic location between Malacca Straits and Sunda Straits, in which this area connecting Indian Ocean include Africa, Middle East, and South Asia to the East Asia and Pacific region. Four cities along the west and the east coast of Sumatra growing as a cos as a cosco as a cosmopolitan port cities, in which became an important enter port on the seafaring routes of Indian Ocean. The next slide. During the medieval times, the Indian Ocean was become the location of intense sailing especially from Muslim sailors and travelers from Arabia and the Persian Gulf. They play a role in forming the, uh, the world's trade network and produce a number of sailing records that provide geographical information on the enter port through which they pass. This study was conducted uh, through uh, historical research methods, namely heuristic, source criticism, interpretation, and historiography with a descriptive analytical approach. In this study, uh, we'll be present with the explain of historical context about Indian Ocean trade, Islamic seafaring, the contact of Islamic world and China or Far East, and such or some example of Arabic literature mean until 15th century. Uh, and the next section, uh, the, the, the paper will be present uh, from my friends, Torin Wajastanto. Uh, okay, I would like to continue uh, our key presentation. Uh, first of all, talking about Indian Ocean Maritime Trade Network. Uh, the maritime trade and seafaring in, in the context of Indian Oceans uh, grown grown uh, since the 7th century and until a late medieval age. Uh, the actors which is important is uh, the Muslim and Arab seafarers, which is uh, from uh, Arabian Peninsula and Persian Gulf. Uh, this context, uh, contact will which even recognized as the farthest seafaring route in the world at the time, and in its study called this region as Arab Mediterranean. So, Indian Ocean Network Maritime Threat uh, uh, called as Arab Mediterranean. And then uh, the point is the Islamic seafaring itself. It it activities it its activities center in the Persian Gulf and Southern Arabian coast, Yaman, Oman, and Damascus. And then they connect the the Strait of Bengal, uh, Indian Archipelago, to reach Canton. Uh, this peak of this trading north took place uh, uh, at the Abbasid Terra, and then uh, this make uh, such a connection between Tang Dynasty and then Abbasid, uh, apa namanya, Abbasid Empire. Uh, Baghdad uh, at that time become a strategic, a strategically uh, cities, capital cities from Abbasid. That uh, connects uh, Baghdad connects with Basra and then connect with uh, the center of Islamic seafaring, which is Al Ubula city and Siraf. Uh, it 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 highlight by George Fadlul Hurani in the Arab seafaring in the Indian Ocean in ancient and early medieval times. The second times uh, the the third time is about uh, the highlight of Tang and Abbasid. Uh, Maritime Threat Network, which is uh, highlighted by John Cafe, uh, because uh, he he says about the 
Muslim settlement in Guangzhou and uh, since uh, the 8th century and then uh, suspect that Muslim settlement from since 7th century uh, itself. And then the transportation, which is very important, is the ship. Uh, John Cafe explained in his book uh, about the Arab Do, which is, he said that since 7th century until 11th century, Arab Do uh, is the only sea ship that capable of such journey, which is 6,000 miles from Basra to Guangzhou. And our research uh, mainly focus to analyze, to analysis, uh, mainly focus to analyze uh, the Arabic literature, nine Arabic literature, which is the first is Rila Asirafi, is written by Sulaiman at Tajiri and Abu Zaid Asirafi, and the second is Murujuz, Murujuz Zahab, Wa Ma'adin Al Jauhar, which is written by Al Mazuki, Ajayb Al Hindi, which is written by Burzu, uh, Al Jugrafia, which is written by Ibn Said, and then Al Masalik Al Mamalik, which is written by Ibn Khartabe. Uh, al Fawai fi Usul Ilmi Al Bahri Wal Kuwait, which is written by Ibn Majid, and Al Minhaj Al Fakir fi Ilmu Al Bahri Al Zakir, which is written by Sulaiman Al Mahri, and Al Umda Al Mahri fi Dab Al Ulum Al Mahri, which is written by Sulaiman Al Mahri, and uh, the Min Al Konun Al Masudi, which is written by Biruni. Uh, from the uh, nine books uh, of Arabic literature itself, we found that there are 16 port cities according to Arabic literature uh, in the time of 9 until 15th century, uh, which is uh, explains the geographical context, uh, the anthropological, anthropological information, and also some uh, descriptions of uh, the, the people itself in, in those, those port cities. Uh, the 16 are Fansur, Balus, Kalah, Lamri, Sarira, Kedir, Sumutra, Medan, Arurok, and Indragiri, Palembang, Singkil, Pariaman, Minangkabau, and Indrapura. At the next, uh, about the examples of analysis, we will provide three uh, for cities as an example will be presented by my friend Purpan Muhammad Faiz. My name is Furkan Muhammad Faiz. I would like to present some examples of Sumatra port cities according to Arabic literature, for instance, Hansur, Lamri, and Kala. Hansur, according, according to Ajayb al Hind, written by Buzuk in Shahriyar al Ram Uzi in 9th to 10th century, in particular page 126, Muhammad bin Babisha told me that the island of Nian, an island out to sea about a hundred parsaks from Fansur, was in, inhabited by people who ate humans. Fansur is one hundred parsak, approximately 500 kilometers from Nias island. Lamuri Lamreh Lamri. According to al Geografia, written by Ibn Sa'id al Madridi in the 13th century, page 108, in Janubi Jazirat al Maharaj, Jazirat al Jawah, al Mashura, al Lati Taksulu al Maraki, Aksaru Mafiha min al Aqafir al Hindija, or Shahara Ahluha, because the Sira, Ma'an Musafirin. Awalu al Gorbi, Haithul Tul, Miaho Arbaun, Miaho Arbao Arbaun al Raja. To the south of Maharaja Island is Jaffa Island, which is very big and famous as a, as a destination for merchant ships. The majority of production is Indian medicine. The residents are known to be friendly travelers. At the western end, located at the longitude of 144 degrees and latitude 5 degrees, at the corner, one of the famous cities among traders, namely the city of Lamri. Allah, according to Akbar al Zaman, Ajayb al Buldan, written by Al Mas'udi in 10th century, page 63, Jazeera al Allah, Yukal in the Halusubay al Abdusin wa Abdul Arab, Taksiruha, Thamanun al Farsah, Wabikala, Mujtama al Amtina, Wabikala, Mujtama al Amtia. 
min min al-'ud wal kafur wa sandal wal 'aj wal rasas al qala'i wal abdus al baqam wal jihaz ilayha fi hadha al waqt min uman then island of kala it is said that this island is located in the middle between tainas and arab lands the area is about 80 farsakhs in kala red commodity this sack as agarwood camphor sandalwood ivory white tin ebony and sapan wood are gathered at this time ship sailing to this island depart from oman our research conclusions reveals that Uh, Sumatra for cities uh, became an important entrepot on the seafaring routes between Indian Oceans, East Asia, and the Pacific. It grown as cosmopolitan for cities connecting to Indian Ocean maritime trade network since 7th century until the late of medieval age. The Muslim seafarers, in particular from Arabian Peninsula and Persian Gulf, play a significant role in establishing the connection of shipping lanes and aromatic spice route. In the early Sumatra, it is evidenced through the number of records and documents of Muslim seafarers, geographers, and historians in the 9th until 15th century, in which function as an important historical sources in the study of early Sumatra and Indian Ocean maritime network. Thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, good, uh, nice to meet you. Thank you very much, Pak Muhammad Faizur Rahman, for this presentation. And we come to the last uh, presenter, the last part, uh, please. Uh, talking about sailing between past and presents, uh, back along as wayfaring practice of orang suku laut Tanjung Biru. Okay, time is yours.
Recording in progress. With the sea is from their uh, is from uh, their small age. Uh, they often uh, uh, they often involved uh, with their parents uh, going bakalam and they observe uh, what their parents do and uh, what their parents see. They fill the sea with their parents asking a question uh, and they start knowing uh, the sea and by going to the sea osl can observe and feel the sea read the science of nature increase their knowledge and upgrade their skill Also, uh, orang suku laut mobility has a certain pattern. It connects. Uh, we we come to their relatives in another island, and uh, we talk about some information or some gossips, uh, and uh, we trade uh, some goods. And about uh, another networks, uh, I. I trace uh, their memory uh, and I found that a lot of my informants uh, still remember how they travel the region across the state border for trading. Even uh, they still remember the name of the Chinese broker in Singapore and still have the memory of when they should play hide and seek with the Marine police. If they get called, the police will